Hi, I'm John Schroeder, and welcome to another edition of KC Clips. We were asked by one of our subscribers to explain what many think was Jesus' moment of doubt on the cross. That was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? First, let me say that the KC readings do not address this question directly. As with many of the videos produced for this channel, we study the Casey readings and offer our own interpretations of the words that we read. What Casey's readings do make clear is that Jesus was indeed the Christ consciousness incarnate. Also, that God is both omniscient and omnipotent, and that his love for us is unconditional. From these things, we can extrapolate answers that are consistent with those basic premises. Have you ever Googled Jesus' words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You will find that they occur three times in the King James Version of the Bible. Two of them are in the New Testament, Matthew 27:46 and Mark 15:34. That is reciting what Jesus is to have said when he was up on the cross. The third occasion is found in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 22. It is Psalms 22's opening verse. If you've not read Psalm 22 for yourself, and you have ever wondered why God incarnate would have doubts on the cross, this discussion is well worth your time. The traditional Christian answer to this question of why God had forsaken him, or at least it seemed like it had, was that Jesus had taken on all the sins of the world upon himself. His death was to be an expiation or payment for our sins if we were to accept him as our Lord and Savior. His moment of doubt came when he was experiencing all that sin placed upon him at the same time. It wasn't too long after that that he regained himself and was able to declare, it is finished. That is the traditional Christian view, and that was the signification, it is finished, that he had fulfilled his role as the Savior. The Casey readings, however, indicate that Jesus is a soul, just like the rest of us, which answers why he would call us all his brothers. According to Casey, what Jesus has done, unlike the rest of us, is to completely accept God's loving ways for his own. In other words, we were all created in God's perfect image, but Jesus was the first among us who made selfish choices, but completely returned to our Creator as perfect as he left. In the same way that many explorers crossed the Atlantic Ocean after learning that Columbus had done it and returned, Jesus was her perfect pattern or role model for how we too can once again be one with God. That perspective in the Casey readings leaves us with a big question. If Jesus didn't take on the sins of all humanity to explain his fearful words on the cross, why did he make such a statement? This is where we go back to Psalm 22, and it all becomes clear. The word count for Psalm 22 is around 600, so I'm not going to read it to you here verbatim. But I invite you to read it for yourself. What you will find is an account of a similar crucifixion detailed in writing more than a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross. The theme of the psalm is that everything is lost by outward appearances. The words speak of a person having their hands and feet pierced, as is done at a crucifixion. And people cast lots or gambled for the person's garment, as is said to have happened with Jesus' robe and the Roman soldiers. The psalm ends, however, with a prediction of God overcoming all this evil, despite how bad it looks at the moment. I see Psalm 22 as Jesus trying to comfort his followers witnessing the crucifixion. The Psalms were well known to all the faithful back in those days. Just like people of today know catchphrases from TV shows and movies, the Psalms were songs sung for entertainment among the faithful of Jesus' time. For instance, some may be too young to remember these, but what if I said, Winston tastes good like, and I asked you to finish that sentence? Anyone over the age of 40 would quickly answer, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Or if I said, fly the friendly skies, and asked you to finish that one-liner, most would be able to reply, fly the friendly skies of United. If you can imagine that Jesus' physical body was close to death, he would be a man of few words, not by fear, but out of necessity. He wanted to comfort the faithful witnessing the crucifixion, but he was not physically able to recite the 600 or so words contained in Psalm 22. However, he also knew that if he gave just the opening verse, that the crowd around him would be able to fill in the rest.
Another interesting point here is that Jesus almost never referred to God as God, but preferred to call him Father. If Jesus wasn't quoting Psalm 22 from the cross, wouldn't he more likely have said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? And there you have it. Psalm 22 describes the true uplifting story behind Jesus' crucifixion. He never doubted his oneness with God. He never thought that God had forsaken him. He was actually doing what he could to comfort the faithful in their agony by reminding them of the message contained in Psalm 22. That's it for this edition of Casey Clips. For our next video, the same subscriber who asked for this Psalm 22 Bible verse to be explained requested an explanation as well of the Bible verse that speaks of the two workers in the field, where one is taken and the other is left behind. This, of course, is said to be a biblical prophecy of the coming rapture. As often occurs when looking at these things from a perspective of a friendly universe and a God of unconditional love, the interpretation is quite different. So until then, remember that God loves you with an everlasting love and that he is unwilling that any soul should be lost.